Hey, Discovery Church family, welcome to Church Online. We are so glad that you are here and joining us today. Church, thank you for being generous with the resources and finances that God has given you. If you'd like to give, check out the link in the description. And if you haven't already gotten connected in a Discovery community, we highly encourage that you do that. You can reach out to our Connections Pastor, Melissa, by emailing her at mpearson at dcboise.org. With every message that goes out, we'll also be having a worship music playlist on YouTube that goes out. You can find that in the link in the description. And make sure to subscribe to our Discovery Church Boise Facebook page and YouTube channel so you can stay connected with everything that's going on. Enjoy this message from Pastor Steve. Well, hi there, everybody. I'm glad to see you again here at Discovery Church, and I wish I could see you. Is it so hard for us not to see each other, isn't it? To hear each other's voices, to hug each other. And I know I've been thinking a lot about these things as we've been talking about this idea of the church being scattered and gathered. And the one thing that I know I feel right now is scatterbrained. I mean, over the past several months, I can't believe the amount of times that I couldn't track conversations or remember people's names, or I'd go to the grocery store specifically to get eggs, and then I don't come home with eggs, but I come home with all this other stuff, and what was that about? And so it's all those things, and I'm glad it's not just me. I'm, just, I'm glad it's not just because I'm 50 this year, but that we're all experiencing this. This is hard, and the fact is our brains are wired by God so that when we encounter threats, that more energy goes to thinking about how to survive those threats, but what it does is it turns down the ability in other areas that we are normally really good at. So if you don't feel as efficient or you don't feel as effective, it's okay. This is just part of trials. And you know, I know that when we think about the trials that the early church went to, we would probably say, wow, this doesn't even compare to that. I mean, they were beaten and flogged and thrown into dirty jails and drugged behind chariots and thrown to wild animals and, and crucified and stoned and all of these things. And we would say, how could we possibly think that, that this compares this. Well, first, I never think it's a good idea for us to compare our hardships with other people's hardships. Because what's hard for me, even in my own family, is different than maybe what my kids think is hard, or what you think is hard, or what somebody across the ocean or across the centuries thinks is hard. But what we do have in common with the believers of the first century is this. We have great wisdom from the writers of the New Testament who witnessed Jesus' life and saw the trials that he went through. And then they went through their own trials. And because of that, they give us great wisdom and they recorded it in the word of God for us to look at. And so let's look at this together. Let's turn to the letter of James. And, and he says he was a slave of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, greetings to the 12 tribes dispersed ab abroad, scattered abroad like seed. My brothers and sisters, Consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect effect, so that you will be perfect and complete, not deficient in anything. So this letter from James, and we don't really know which James. There was three, and it could have been one of the three. And we don't exactly know when it was written, but it was probably mid-first century to late-first century when it was written doesn't really matter. We know that the church was experiencing all those trials that I mentioned earlier. And so as we think about this, we think about this statement, consider it nothing but joy, or maybe as you memorized it like I did as a kid, as a kid consider it pure joy. I mean, it just makes you want to go, Woo, let's have a party, trials, maybe not so much. Because, you know, if you ask me what I think of as pure joy, I think of Cody and Ali Vedito bringing Sophia home from the hospital after being in the NICU for a month, right? Or I think of being on top of a, of, a, of a dormant volcano in Maui with my wife watching a sunset. That's pure joy. I think even this summer when we got to pick the first fruit of the, the garden boxes that we had planted, it's like zucchini! And pretty soon it'll be like, oh, zucchini, too much zucchini, right? That's pure joy. Those things that, that delight our hearts. But trials? I mean, really, James? Really? Wow. What is he asking us to do? And how can he possibly ask us to do that? Well, he's asking us to consider it pure joy. He's not saying it is pure joy. He's saying, I want you to reframe this. I want you to rethink this in your mind and in your heart. And then he gives the reason for it. It's because of what it's going to produce 
in you. So let's go to a few related scriptures that no doubt uh, worked their way out through the church, through Paul and, and the others who wrote them. Romans 8, 28 and 29, we all know this is a very, very familiar scripture. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Why? Because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, who would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, I know none of us love having that scripture thrown in our face, but it is scripture. It is true. Ephesians 4, 13 and 14, he's talking about what's the work of the of, of pastors and teachers and prophets and evangelists and, and apostles. It's so that they grow the church up until they reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, and then will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the different waves blown here and there and every wind and teaching, cunning and craftiness of people. And it's funny that he uses that language because just down below in James 1, he talks about the wind and the waves when we doubt, when we ask for wisdom. And so are you saying, Steve, what, I'm an infant because this is hard? No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that this is kind of Christianity 201. This may not be the very fundamental stuff, but this is kind of basic Christianity. How do we look at the things that we're suffering, the trials that we're going through, and the hardships that we're in? How do we interpret them? How do we respond to them? How do we trust God in the middle of them? Jesus' closest followers watched him suffer. They experienced their own set of trials. And this is what they said. And it's a narrative of their life that they were able to say this. And we know that droves of people saw the joy in the midst of those trials and said, if they can hope, then maybe we can hope too. The narrative of the Bible is this, whenever we suffer, God can redeem that. And we see that throughout scripture. But a lot of it is gonna depend on us, what it turns into. In fact, I really believe this, trials are going to produce something in you. And the question is, what are they gonna produce? You see, there's, there's one branch that it might produce endurance or patience or long-suffering or maturity. And then there's this other branch where it can produce bitterness or anger or disappointment or disillusionment or, or doubt or outright disbelief in God. And you see, which of those things it produces in us when we go through hardships is going to depend a lot on what we choose. Do we choose joy to consider something as joyful? None of us like suffering, though. I mean, when I was three or four years old and I came here to Idaho to visit um, my dad after they separated and my stepmom, she was probably in her early 20s and I don't know how much she liked kids, but she would say, Stevie, do you want some candy? And you know, as a young kid, it's like, yeah, I want some candy. And she would say, suffer. And I would just, just tear up and say, but, but I don't want no suffer. It was a classic story told over and over. So I know exactly how it sounded in her ears. Now, let me, uh, let me make sure I put a disclaimer on this. She was not the wicked stepmother you see in many uh, fairy tales, okay? She was a great stepmother. But she, she had this way of, of, of maybe portraying something that wasn't true about her. And I think, I, I tell that story, A, because it's funny, and B, because I think sometimes we have a misconception about God, that, that we're asking for things, for Him to bless us, for Him to prosper us, and then we feel like what happens in our life is He's saying, suffer. And we're like, but I don't want no suffer, right? And so it's really important that we understand God's not sitting up in his bedroom somewhere dreaming up ways to make us miserable just so that we can mature. No, I don't believe that at all. I, I believe that we have enough trials and hardships in this world because it's a fallen place, because there's sin in it, and because it's broken, that he doesn't have to invent suffering for us. He redeems hardships and trials if we choose to let them be redeemed. Now, a little bit further down here, James continues to say, he says, happy, blessed is the one who endures testing because when he is proven to be genuine, he will receive the crown of life that God promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself tempts no one. And he goes on for a couple of verses to talk about the nature of sin. But then he says, don't be led astray, my dear brothers and sisters. All generous giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or the slightest hint of change. All good things 
come the Father, from the Father, and there's no hint of darkness in any of those gifts. So I, I want to leave you with this thought and this question. First, if you're having trouble seeing how this particular hardship, you know, COVID-19 or other things happening in the world or in your life personally, if you're wondering how they can produce any good thing, we need to first check our beliefs about God and what his intentions are towards us. Meditate on what the scriptures say about his character towards you. In fact, this is one of the things that I miss the most about being together. It's our weekly meditation in singing about the goodness of God and about what his intentions for us are, about what his character is. And you know, it, it, because we're not together, I have to be a lot more intentional about doing that. And, and I'm afraid many times I haven't done that this, this spring and this summer to focus on the character of God, to remind myself what his intentions towards humanity is. And so we, we, we get off base, we get askew, we start focusing on the news or this or that or the other thing, and we start getting muddled in our thinking. The second thing though is this, and is really an outgrowth of the first, I wanna remind us where to put our focus because in Hebrews it says very clearly, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us get rid of every weight in the sin that so easily entangles and the sin that clings so easily and run with endurance the race that is set out for us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and finisher of our faith, who, listen to this, for the joy set out before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Think of him. Think of him who endured such opposition against himself by sinners, so that you may not grow weary in your souls and give up. See, this is what we can focus on. When we need to consider this joyful, we need to think of Jesus. He considered looking through the cross, looking past the trial, looking through to a different finish line, maybe than you or I might look to. And so one of the things that we need to think about is what, what's our finish line right now? Do we think that the finish, I mean, I, I remember back in March, it's like, well, I've got an, a, an event planned in, in April. Yeah, we'll probably be done with this by then. And then it was like, well, we'll probably be done with this by, I don't know, June. And now it's like, well, by the time school starts, and now it's like, well, maybe January. And, you know, well, when there's a vaccine, we'll be done with this. It's like, it's the wrong finish line to, for us to focus on. We're focused on trying to move to something different than towards Christ. And see, I think that we have to reframe and our focus towards him and think about his character in the process of doing so. So let's just pray. And there may be a place of repentance for us in this and encourage you to talk about that with your groups or to call a friend up and, and talk about that. Because Heavenly Father, we, we admit that it's so easy for us to focus on the wrong things, to focus on what we can see rather than to focus on you. And so, Heavenly Father, I ask that you would reorient our hearts, that you would draw us, that you would woo us to your presence more and more, and that we would see you, Jesus, more clearly than we ever have in the middle of all of this. Give us strength, give us peace, and give us your joy that in the middle of this, you are producing something good, that you do have a crown of life for us who endure, and those of us who love you and we thank you for that. Thank you and God bless you in your week ahead. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to our Discovery Church Boise YouTube channel if you haven't already. We'll catch you next week.